January 1990, Portland, Oregon. A young woman disappeared after playing a game of pool with some men at a local bar. Days later, her body was discovered, the victim of a brutal rape and murder. But there were no clues as to the identity of the killer. We didn't get a lot of reports about someone missing that turned out to be a homicide. What looked like an isolated murder became the first in a string of grisly killings, one of the worst serial crimes in Oregon's history. If there was a level of horror, it was that this man appeared to kill for entertainment. As well as the police, others also chronicled the investigation on film, on paper, and on tape. Through their lenses, they captured the story of the Happy Face Killer. January 1990, Multnomah County, Oregon. This peaceful part of the American Northwest is covered with forests, rivers, and ravines. The central part of Multnomah County is the city of Portland. And when you get uh, about 12 miles east of Portland, you get into what is known as the Columbia Gorge, which has been designated as a scenic area. It's got a lot of uh, evergreen trees, a lot of uh, hills and mountains. Yeah, it's a very pleasant area. Despite being one of the largest urban centers for the region, Portland enjoys a low crime rate. Crime was actually coming down in, the, uh, in those years because for about the last 30 years, violent crime in particular has diminished. Considering the population, our murder rate is actually rather low. Most of the people in Multnomah County live a laid-back lifestyle. In 1990, one of those people was Tanya Bennett. She was 23 years old and lived with her mother. Tanya was described by her friends and family as a free spirit. My understanding is that she was a, a very friendly type person. She would approach uh, people that she didn't know and strike up conversations. The 21st of January. It was a damp day in Portland. Tanya grabbed her umbrella and bag and went to the B&I Tavern near Interstate 5, hoping to meet up with some friends. She met a group of men who invited her to play a game of pool. Hours later, Tanya left the bar, possibly with one of the men that she'd been playing pool with. I think she got attracted to going to bars and drinking because it was a way she got reinforcement for her personality. She was, by all accounts, a very nice young woman. But unfortunately, she also had a habit of, of leaving places with people, uh, with men. And there were people that knew her that were concerned about that behavior. When Tanya didn't come home the next day, her family became concerned. There was a strong feeling that maybe she had just wandered away. And it, I, I think initially, there was some serious doubt whether she'd met with any foul play. The 23rd of January. After two days, Tanya had still not turned up. But the investigation into her whereabouts was cut short when a local student made a gruesome discovery. Tanya Bennett's body was found out in the Columbia Gorge off of the scenic highway out there. Her body was actually observed down in the woods in a um, hair, back in, in, a, in a hairpin turn in the laying in the woods in the brush and she was observed by an individual who was there, and then they called the police. The police secured the crime scene and began the detailed work of photographing and collecting evidence. Based on the position of the body, the police determined that the actual murder was committed at another location. She had one arm that was in a raised position. There wasn't a lot of blood or any of that sort of thing because she hadn't been murdered at that location. Crime scene investigators would have looked to try and determine where her body was taken from and, and, and where it was dropped. And so they would, they would look along that path trying to find any objects that may have fallen out of anybody's pockets. Detectives did not find any uh, billfold or purse or any identifying objects. One significant clue was discovering that a section of Tanya's jeans had been ripped out and removed, possibly as a souvenir for the killer. Apart from this, the crime scene provided little in the way of hard physical evidence. It's very difficult to collect 
good physical evidence from a dump site because that's not where the murder occurred. It may have been that the, the victim was transported in a trunk or a car, and so the, the individual might stop right there alongside the road, push the body out, and, and be on their way. So there's really no other associated evidence right there at that scene. The body of Tanya Bennett was carefully removed for a full autopsy. Her body showed obvious signs of trauma from being beaten, and the marks around her neck indicated possible strangulation. I attended Tanya Bennett's autopsy in January of 1990, uh, collected physical evidence, the clothing items she was wearing. Uh, I collected tape lifts from her body. Those items then were brought back to the laboratory from the medical examiner's office, where I then was then tasked with conducting examination of those physical evidence items. The autopsy revealed nothing that linked Tanya Bennett directly to her killer. The lack of evidence made it difficult for the authorities to identify the body. It was only after a news report of the discovery that a positive identification could be made. It was after some media coverage that Tanya Bennett was identified because I believe her mother came forward and said, my daughter's missing. With little physical evidence to go on, the police relied on detective work to catch the culprit. Witnesses from the BNI Tavern recalled seeing Tanya, but were vague about who she might have left with. They did not have very many leads. They knew that she, they knew her general location and residence, and they knew that she frequented a, um, um, bars in that area. They believed that she had left the bar in the presence of someone, but they had no physical description. Your hope is that you find the car that was used or the actual murder scene itself, um, in which case you might find more evidence that actually associates it back to another individual. Both local people and the authorities reacted to the violent crime with disbelief. Uh, missing people came back uh, home rather soon, and so missings that were turned out to be deaths were, was a pretty unusual occurrence. The police appealed to the public, asking for help with any clues that might bring them closer to Tanya's killer. Within a few weeks of the murder, they really were not receiving much. There were people who had been in the area where the body was found that thought they had information to contribute to it, but it really, really all ran into nothing. The 5th of February, the police got a break in the case. The sheriff's office received an anonymous phone call a female called up and indicated that she knew who had committed the murder, and she, she named a name. The police were quick to respond to the tip-off. Investigators were delighted that, that these anonymous calls were coming in because they hadn't, at that point, they really hadn't identified anybody as a suspect. The phone call came from a 57-year-old woman called Laverne Pavlinak. After leaving two anonymous messages, Pavlinak came forward with her story. At some point, Laverne called up and identified herself and says, I'm Laverne Pavlinak, and I'm living with John Sosnovsky, and I think John is responsible uh, for the murder of Tanya Bennett. It was the call the police needed to move forward with their investigation. But when you get a break in a case, there's always an adrenaline rush. And so to get that sort of a phone call, particularly if the person on the other end of the line seemed credible, it's very exciting. The story Laverne Pavlinak told the police detailed the shocking rape and murder of an innocent young woman at the hands of Pavlinak's live-in boyfriend. But there was more than one killer involved in Laverne's story, and there were to be many more victims. February 1990, Portland, Oregon. The police investigating the murder of Tanya Bennett received a tip-off from 57-year-old Laverne Pavlinak. A female was trying to implicate John Sosnovsky in a homicide, and subsequently law enforcement determined that the caller was in fact Laverne Pavlinak. As a result of the, the anonymous calls that Laverne made, law enforcement went out and talked to her. Pavlinak revealed to the police that she had overheard Sosnovsky bragging to a friend about killing Tanya. 
she was talking about a truck stop on Interstate 5 south of Portland where John had been hanging out. According to Levin, Sosnovsky left the truck stop with Tanya and drove to a building called Vista House where he raped and murdered her. In addition to him being placed at the scene by Laverne, a police search of Sosnovsky's personal belongings also uncovered an incriminating note. They found a, a piece of paper, and on that piece of paper it said, T. Bennett, good piece. There was some assumption that maybe that John Sosnovsky had uh, created that document. When the authorities questioned John Sosnovsky, he maintained his innocence. The police asked him to submit to a lie detector test, and he agreed. With regard to John Sosnovsky's polygraph examination, it's my recollection that he was being deceptive in his statements. Days after the police search, Laverne called them with more evidence. As further proof, Laverne produced a section of ripped jeans. It was the same size and shape as the piece, probably torn off and removed by Tanya's killer. And the police took that to the crime lab and tried to match it to the, to the Levi's of Tanya Bennett. And they realized at that point that this was not a legitimate piece of evidence and that, that uh, Laverne was trying to implicate her boyfriend very hard. So they, were, they weren't ignoring her, but they were certainly puzzled by her actions. Despite the fabricated evidence, the police focused their investigation on Sosnovsky. I believe that Laverne Pavlinek was involved in a relationship that she wanted to get out of. This relationship with Laverne apparently had been a very um, bad relationship. He was a very severe alcoholic. Laverne got frustrated with the investigators because she felt like she had given them everything they needed to arrest John Sosnovsky, but the investigators uh, felt like the information was very sketchy. In building the case against Sosnovsky, Laverne's testimony was still all the police had to go on. There were no eyewitnesses to the crime and nothing tying Sosnovsky to the victim. That John Sosnovsky had no details that were helpful to the investigation. John adamantly de denied any involvement in, in this homicide. Without sufficient evidence, the police could not apply for an arrest warrant for Sosnovsky. It was shortly thereafter that Laverne contacted law enforcement when she realized that John Sosnovsky was not likely to get arrested. She called up one of the detectives and said something to the effect that it's correction time. And what she meant by that is, I need to get my story correct to you folks, and I need to tell you that I was there when all these things happened. February. In a stunning revelation, Laverne Pavlinak came forward and offered a full confession to the police, claiming that she had participated in the rape and murder of Tanya Bennett. Laverne's explanation of the way in which the crime occurred was both detailed and, again, fit what occurred from the facts. Laverne described a sequence of meeting Tanya Bennett at a truck stop south of Portland that John and she were driving Tanya Bennett north into Portland. They got up on the scenic highway out by the Vista house, and she describes that initially it was all kind of playful, and, and, and uh, that sh she assumed that John was going to have sex with Tanya. When they got up to the Vista house, she described it as it turned much more sinister, and that at that point, uh, John raped her, and that, that there was actually a, a rope tied around Tanya's uh, neck. Including her strangling Tanya while he's beating on her, while John's beating on her. And then they load the car, you know, they wrap her up in this stuff, and they take her down, and they throw her out on the, um, on the side of the road. The police found it difficult to believe that the 57-year-old woman was capable of such a heinous crime. After she confessed, she looked like everybody's grandmother. She was very soft-spoken, a very mild-mannered, pleasant woman who had, who had not led a life of crime. So it was a real puzzle to, to the investigators when she started trying to say that she was involved in a homicide.
To ensure that Laverne was telling the truth, the police devised a plan to test the validity of her confession. The detectives investigating this case took Laverne for a drive, and they said, OK, Laverne, tell us where you dumped the body, where you and John dumped the body. She was placed in the back seat. They, were, they watched her very carefully uh, so that she couldn't observe the odometer because it became common knowledge that this body had been dumped a mile and a half from the Vista house. When she got out to the area where the body was dumped, uh, she got out of the car and pointed to the exact spot where this body was dumped. And that was presented to us by the detectives that there's no way in the world anybody could have found that body. Up until that point, it was very difficult to believe that she was involved in a homicide. And when she did take him to this dump site, it was really hard to discount her story. Armed with this information and Laverne Pavlinak's confession, the police had enough evidence to apply for an arrest warrant from the prosecutors. At that point, this was all on tape. The detectives are saying, well, my God, we've got a tape statement from this woman who says she was there when this crime was committed. They went and talked to the prosecutors. Uh, Jim McIntyre said, well, where is Laverne today? And they said, well, she's still at home. And said she just confessed to a murder, you need to go arrest her. News of the unusual couple's arrest quickly spread throughout the county. And it was so strange because you had the killing of a young woman. You had a couple that was originally involved, and most murders are committed by one person. It happens in real life so rarely that this became a, a really fascinating case, both for reporters and for the public. It's pretty unusual for an individual to implicate someone that they know well, as well as themselves, in a, in a murder crime. Charged with multiple counts of aggravated murder, a trial date was set for 57-year-old Laverne Pavlinak. With a full confession and intimate knowledge of the crime, the evidence was stacked against her. Laverne had put together a very strong case against her and John, and there was no other, other evidence out there to counter the case. But when Laverne Pavlinak took the stand in court, she changed her story for the second time. She recanted her earlier confession and entered a plea of not guilty. Pavlinak told the jury that she had made up the entire scenario based on what she had read in the newspapers in order to frame her abusive boyfriend, John Sosnowski. But by that time, we had a multitude of statements and we were in a position where, well, are you lying then or are you lying now? Pavlinak insisted that she herself had planted the note in Sosnovsky's papers and that she'd fabricated the evidence of the ripped jeans from a pair of trousers belonging to her granddaughter. I believe the police and the prosecutors uh, during the trial believed that, that Laverne Pavlinak was lying. I mean, she had told, she had been telling them for, for a period of weeks that she was involved or she knew someone was involved in this homicide. And as very typically, after you after you get into the courtroom, if you're going to take the witness stand, you're going to try and change your story. The case for the prosecution appeared to be strong. We had her taped confession, and you betcha we played it. I played it over and over again. Can't have a, a, a standalone confession is not sufficient to convict anybody. But we had the evidence to corroborate. Facts were that, that she actually was holding, you know, the rope to, or the cord to strangle Tanya with. The 31st of January, 1991, the jury returned their verdict. Laverne was found guilty of um, felony murder and the sexual assault as an aider and abetter, as an accomplice. And she was sentenced to life in prison. The trial for John Sosnowski was scheduled to begin in March. However, before the trial began, Sosnowski changed his plea from not guilty to no contest, hoping that his cooperation would lessen his sentence. John ended up not going to trial. Once Mr. Brennan and Mr. Sosnowski saw that Laverne had been convicted by a jury, he was really probably facing tremendous jeopardy, uh, up to and including perhaps the death penalty. Sosnowski was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole for 15 years. The verdicts were reported by the local news media, 
the people of Portland were riveted by the bizarre case of the elderly murderer and her boyfriend. Your, your imagination could run wild with, with what might happen next because the developments in this case were so strange that you, you, you expected that the next day there was going to be a new and even wilder revelation than the day before. One strange development that caught the public's attention came from a nearby state. While the trial was still underway, graffiti relating to the case suddenly appeared in the toilets of a truck stop in Montana. Somebody had written on a bathroom wall or the door of the bathroom that, you know, he was responsible for the death of Tanya Bennett. News of the graffiti was brought to the attention of the authorities in Oregon. The police dismissed it as a hoax. What the officers thought when his, when his writings started appearing was that there was some crackpot out there that was trying to claim credit for a homicide. The trial had publicity. Everyone knew what was going on as far as the local area. People, anybody traveling through would have known that, that there was a woman on trial for killing these two people. And all you need is some yahoo in a truck stop to write something down. We have no idea of who it is or where it is or where it came from. The judge hearing the case ruled that the graffiti was inadmissible evidence. On the 25th of March, Laverne Pavlinak began serving her sentence. The case appeared to be closed. She was sentenced for a murder, and, uh, and uh, Laverne was not a young woman. Everyone assumed it was a life sentence for Laverne. March 1994, three years after the conclusion of the Tanya Bennett trial, an anonymous letter arrived at an Oregon courthouse. The initial letter that was sent to the Beaverton courts in Oregon was somebody claiming responsibility for the death of Tanya Bennett, indicating that they had strangled her and dumped her body. It was a uh, handwritten letter. The handwriting on the anonymous letter was similar to the graffiti found in the Montana truck stop. But the most baffling aspect of the letter was how its author had signed off. Signed with a happy face, <clears throat> but no name. A few weeks later, a second letter arrived at the local newspaper, also signed with a happy face. They detailed the murder of five different women in different uh, parts of the country. The tone was, it was very mocking in the fact that uh, he wasn't going to turn himself in. He, I, th I think he was enjoying it. If these letters were real, the police had to face the possibility that the wrong people had been convicted of Tanya's murder. Worse still, it would mean that the happy face killer was still on the streets and seemingly determined to kill again. 1994, Portland, Oregon. Laverne Pavlinak and John Sosnovsky were in prison for the rape and murder of Tanya Bennett. Three years after their conviction, anonymous letters began to arrive, first at an Oregon court and then at a local newspaper. There was a letter that was sent to a newspaper columnist by the name of Phil Stanford. That was simply signed, The Happy Face Killer. There was an admission in there that he was the one responsible for killing Tanya Bennett and that the people that were in jail did not do the killings. At first, the police decided that the letters were a hoax, probably written by an associate of the accused in an attempt to get them out of jail. It was probably a friend of John Sanowski's that might have been in jail with him that might have written that up, trying to throw the investigators off the track. I didn't think anything of it beyond it was a curiosity. It makes for great conspiracy theory. It makes for great newspaper columns, but it, it doesn't make for any evidence or anything to move forward on. We've done a full trial with Laverne and a plea by the way of John Sosnowski. That was all based on evidence, procedure, and law. Now we have this anonymous letter that comes in, no evidence to support anything that's being alleged by this supposed killer that's on the loose. The letter to Phil Stanford not only included details about Tanya Bennett, but also about four other women who the author claimed to have killed, including specific locations where he had disposed of the bodies. What the Oregonian newspaper did at that point was they assigned an investigator or assigned a uh, reporter to it to go out and talk to different agencies 
bodies to see. In fact, they did have bodies at these different locations. Some of those uh, bodies that were identified in the letter or locations that were identified in the letter were actually ongoing investigations that had stalled for whatever reason. Included in the letter were details about the killings not made known to the public. For example, one of them indicated that he stepped on her neck to make sure she was dead. Another one indicated that there was a big breasted blonde that he had killed. Another one indicated that he tied her with duct tape. All of these things were information that only the killer or the investigators on the case would know. People were horrified. People were absolutely horrified that you would have a man who would take lives and then effectively brag about taking those lives, sign his notes with the happy face, and effectively make fun of the authorities as though, ha, 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 you can't catch me. I'm the happy face killer. You know, the smiley face that probably has been drawn by a thousand little girls. Here's this little smiley face, this simple little symbol, and it's been chosen by a killer. With news of a possible serial killer still at large, there was considerable pressure on the police to sort out the facts in this increasingly confusing case and to ensure that the public was safe. They did not have a lot to go on. We had nothing to connect all the dots with all these investigations. We knew there were bodies at different locations, but we had no common thread that ran through all of them. We had no physical evidence that we could take from one to another case. The 11th of March, 1995, the body of 41-year-old Julianne Winningham was discovered on a heavily wooded riverbank near the Columbia River. The discovery of another victim, killed and disposed of in a manner almost identical to Tanya Bennett, might prove to be the common thread that the investigators needed to connect the murders. She was naked with her back against underbrush that kept her from rolling downhill. So it was obvious that she had to walk there. And the fact that she was uh, naked suggested that she'd been dumped there. Crime scene investigators secured the scene and began to collect evidence. I was tasked with um, evidence collection and documenting where Julie Winningham's body was at, was located at. And from there, combing the area for any other kinds of physical evidence that might link her or a suspect to that location or to her. And from there, it went to um, an autopsy. She had on her face and around her neck little bits of tape residue that we immediately suspected tape or duct tape had been over her mouth. With the late afternoon sun disappearing behind the trees, crime scene investigators were losing precious daylight. They decided to remove the body for further examination. Her body from there was moved to the Clark County Medical Examiner's Office, where it was examined by the forensic pathologist for other signs of evidence. There was a sexual assault evidence collection kit that contained various samples, some of which were swabs taken from uh, Julie Winningham, and there was also a vial of blood that was taken from uh, Julie Winningham at autopsy. The results of the autopsy revealed that Julianne had been raped and murdered. The cause of death was strangulation. Once Julie was identified by her fingerprints, a number of detectives went out to try and contact her family or any known associates. I believe the Clark County detectives' leads started bearing fruit when they determined who Julianne Winningham had been dating, and I think that was their big break in this case. Julianne Winningham, according to her mother, had arrived at her residence previously, probably about two weeks before, at 2 o'clock in the morning. She had this humongous person with her who she identified as Chris at the time. We didn't know who Chris was. All we knew was that he was a long-haul truck driver. The police learned that the large trucker Julianne Winningham had been dating had helped Julie sell her car. When the detectives retrieved the bill of sale, they noticed a crucial detail. Uh, the name at the bottom of a witness to the bill of sale to make it more legal was Keith Hunter Jesperson. 
We ran his name through our computer system. We did not come up with a match, and we did not have any criminal history that we were aware of. It could have been another dead end. Looking back on it, I realize now it was an extremely important part of the investigation, an extremely important break in the investigation, if you will. Keith Jesperson was reported to be a long-haul truck driver, and he drove for a company that operated in a number of different states. So he was going to be difficult to contact to question about Julie. So that required the assistance of the company that he worked for. They were extremely cooperative. The trucking company itself was able to give us information about where he was, where he was going to be delivering his next load at. In fact, he was in Chicago at the time and said that he was going to be in New Mexico uh, the following Monday. So we flew down to New Mexico ahead of him. Detective Rick Buckner asked the haulage company to get Jesperson to pick up a load from a local fairground. Buckner and two other detectives were waiting for him when he pulled in. I think he was stunned. I think he was shocked that we'd come all the way from Washington to talk to him about a case that we were working on. Color drained out of his face. You could tell he was surprised that we were there. The detectives took Jesperson to the local county sheriff's office to obtain blood and hair samples. In an interview that lasted over five hours, Jesperson admitted to being a former boyfriend of Julianne Winningham, but he denied any knowledge of her death. And that the last time he saw her was parked in a vacant lot between Camas and Washougal in Clark County, and that they had an argument. She got out of the truck and left. He didn't know what happened to her after that. Despite his claim of innocence, Jesperson's odd behavior during the interview raised Buckner's suspicions. He wasn't volunteering information. He never once asked us what happened to her. He never once uh, expressed any concern over her death. I just had a feeling that there was a lot more to this than what he was telling us. But we didn't have the right to detain him any longer than that. So once we interviewed him, he was free to go, and he knew that. Before he released the truck driver, Detective Buckner handed Jesperson a card with his contact information. What I was trying to do was build rapport with him. I told Keith, I said, call me. Call me in a week. Either I'm going to take you out of my investigation or put you into it. He was agreeable. He said he'd call me. I didn't think he would ever admit to anything. He had pretty much stonewalled us. Five days later, Buckner's strategy paid off. On Friday, I was checking my voicemail, and I had received a phone message from Jesperson. It said, you were right. I want to turn myself in. And then he hung up. That's unheard of. <laughs> I've never known anyone to have a confession on voicemail. I was ecstatic, as it looked like this case was going to come together. And it was such a fabulous break in the case. People that engage in those kind of crimes traditionally don't talk about them, and they certainly don't leave voicemail messages. Thanks to great detective work, Keith Jesperson was ready to turn himself in for the brutal rape and murder of Julianne Winningham. But with a series of unsolved murders to get to the bottom of, the real question facing the police was, who is the happy face killer? March 1995. The police investigating the murder of Julianne Winningham got a break in the case when Keith Jesperson, the lorry driver, admitted to the crime. He wanted to get it over with. He wanted to be recognized for something he had done. And I, I think he wanted the attention. I, I think he knew the end was near. He thought that we were following him. In a rare move, Jesperson called Detective Rick Buckner and offered a full confession over the phone. He admitted to me that he, in fact, killed Julianne Winningham by putting his fist into her throat. And he explained to me that he also had duct tape that he wrapped around her mouth because he wasn't sure if she was dead or not. And he wanted to make sure that she didn't wake up and start screaming at him again. The officers believed the actual murder happened in the, his truck. The fact that he didn't seem to maintain a regular residence, traveled all the time, it made sense that it probably did occur in his truck. He would spend uh, days on the road and, and would virtually live in his truck. Didn't appear that he had the same route all the time. He was, he was all over the country. Buckner contacted the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office with news of Jesperson's arrest. Detective Buckner told me that 
uh, he had someone in custody on a murder case and that he thought this person could have been involved or possibly been involved in one of our murders and we already had two people in prison. The first time I met him was in the Clark County Jail. I mean, he's a big guy in stature, um, very soft-spoken, um, very, very straightforward appearing, looks you right in the eye, you know, can joke with you. The day I met Keith Jesperson, it was like meeting a big farm boy. He did not have the usual trademarks of criminals that, that I was very used to dealing with. In addition to the confession, detectives retrieved a letter that Jesperson had written to his brother. I did tell him at one point, I said, Keith, I said, you owe it to your family to let them know what happened before they read about it in the papers. He said, Rick, he says, don't worry about it. He says, I've already sent my brother a letter. We recovered the letter from his brother and turned it over to us. Uh, the letter was, in fact, a, an admission that he had killed eight women. Jesperson confessed to the authorities that he was the happy face killer. The first victim was clearly identified in the letter as Tonya Bennett. Forensic experts compared the letter to Jesperson's brother with those from the happy face killer. We were able to uh, obtain some DNA that subsequently was matched to Keith Jesperson off of one of the letters. The fact that both letters were written by the same person was extremely important because the first letter had identified the different victims of the different cases that we were investigating at that point. I thought, wow, this is fantastic. You know, not only do we have the death of Julianne Winningham, but we also have seven other victims out there that we have to identify. And I proceeded to go ahead and send out teletypes after, to different police agencies at that point. With the happy face killer in custody, word of Jesperson's arrest spread across America. We had a lot of inquiries from other agencies. We had, we had other uh, newspapers that were trying to get in here and get a story. But to have a murder that allegedly was committed by two people is, is especially unusual. To then have those two people convicted, sent to prison, and then to have another person implicated in it, completely off the charts unusual. So very strange, very different. With Laverne Pavlinak and John Sosnowski still in prison for the rape and murder of Tanya Bennett, the police were under considerable pressure to get to the bottom of the story. Why are these people still in prison? If somebody else did this crime, shouldn't he be in prison? Shouldn't they be freed? And that's an enormous pressure. When the news media, when the newspapers lead and the television and radio then repeat those stories, uh, that puts a lot of pressure on law enforcement. The authorities focused their efforts on getting to the bottom of what actually took place on that rainy night in 1990. They began with Jesperson's confession. He claims that he picked her up at a bar, they had taken her to his apartment, or his house. Uh, they wanted to have sex, or he wanted to have sex with her, and she commented about, just hurry up and get it over with. At that point, he lost it because that reminded him of his ex-wife, and he just put his fist in her throat. Detectives were certain that Keith Hunter Jesperson had murdered Tanya Bennett. Unfortunately, they were at a frustrating impasse. They still lacked any hard physical evidence to strengthen their case. Everything that he provided them, as far as her description, uh, how she was dressed, everything could have been information taken from the newspapers, information that anybody would have known. It wasn't until we were able to bring forth evidence that only the killer would know, that Jesperson was able to provide to us. As they're done with Laverne Pavlinak, the police took Jesperson to the crime scene and asked him to indicate the exact spot where he'd disposed of Tanya's body. When he showed us the spot where he had claimed to have dumped Tanya Bennett's body, he didn't pinpoint the exact spot. He, he was within uh, several hundred yards, but he didn't pinpoint the spot. Discouraged by Jesperson's inability to locate the site where he'd left Tanya's body, the detectives turned the car around and headed back to the sheriff's office. Then Jesperson did something unexpected. He, he stopped, he goes, well, I think I threw her purse out in this area. 
Well, that was the very first we had heard about the person. That was the first time after hours and hours of talking to Jesperson that we got what we considered to be a nugget. The investigator, Chris Peterson, recruited some search teams and had them scour the area. Their efforts revealed no evidence. And they didn't find anything. And so he said, I'm going to send them out one more time. So he sends them out one more time. And on Saturday night, he calls me, he pages me. And I return the page and I get him on the phone. I said, so what's up? And he says, are you sitting down? I said, yeah, what? What's going on? He says, I got Tanya Bennett's driver's license in my hand. So it was uh, certainly an emotional experience because up until that point, I was writing that I didn't think Keith Jesperson was involved in this homicide because I had virtually nothing to connect him to the homicide. But the one single point of the driver's license at that location under those circumstances with everything else he gave us, because we now know Jesperson's good for this murder. The discovery of that purse and Jesperson leading them to it made that such a convincing case. The authorities had no choice but to pay attention to it and then to go back and re-examine what had happened to Sosnowski and Pavlinek in the original case involving Tanya Bennett. Chris Peterson worked hard to get the Multnomah County District Attorney acquainted with all the intricacies of the case. He knew they would have an uphill battle. But the reality of, of it is, in the United States, once someone's been convicted in a courtroom by a jury, uh, it's virtually impossible to change that verdict. And certainly anonymous letters were not going to change the outcome of the case. But the Tanya Bennett driver's license was found in uh, underneath five years of blackberry growth, and, and that was what changed uh, the direction of this case, and, and that's the only reason that uh, John Sosnovsky and Laverne Pavlinek were ever released from prison. November 1995, with Jesperson offering a full confession and guilty plea, the mysterious murder of Tanya Bennett was finally solved. Because he's also, you know, he's a targeted serial killer. He didn't just want to kill you or me or anybody he ran into. He had a, he had a group of people that he was killing, and Tanya Bennett was fit that group. I don't think uh, Keith Hunter Jesperson should ever be released. I think he's a danger to society. Here's a man that's killed eight women that we know of, and he enjoyed killing. Would he ever stop? I don't think so. I don't think he should ever walk free among people again. After serving four years for a crime they did not commit, Laverne Pavlinak and John Sosnovsky were released from prison. It was a uh, pretty uh, incredible wake-up call that people can be sent to prison um, for something they didn't do. For those personally affected by the happy face killer, life will never be the same again. Julie Winningham had children. They don't have, they no longer have a mother. She was 41 years old at the time. So it's a lot of years that her family was deprived of her company. Julianne's family was traumatized by this whole incident. Her son had a hard time dealing with it. Well, it's gotta be rough. I know that if I called my mom and said, hey, I need to come wherever you are, she would have accepted me. That's what I missed the most. And it's hard to accept, but I got to, to be able to move on or else he'll always win if I don't move on. I'm proud that I survived and I did it in my own way. And I'm talking because someone needs to speak out for victims. Tragically, the trail of victims could perhaps have been avoided were it not for Laverne Pavlinak. When La Laverne Pavlinak lied and constructed this whole case against John Sosnovsky, the investigation of the death of Tanya Bent stopped. Who knows what would have happened if Laverne Pavlinak would have never chosen to lie and stepped into that case.